Um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. I can see people have been popping in, but I think everybody's here now. Lenshina, uh, thank you very much for hosting, uh, for, for chairing this event. And I am going to hand over to you. Hey, Krutapa, welcome, welcome everybody to Fair Trade Storytelling Behind the Scenes. Uh, my name's Len Sheena, and I'm a, I run a fair trade shop in lovely West Wales called Fair, fair and Fabulous, and I'm also chair of BAFS, the UK Fair Trade Network. We're lucky to be joined today by three brilliant communication professionals from fair trade organisations. And they'll be sharing how they tell their fair trade stories and how storytelling has changed in recent years. Most people in the UK know that fair trade is about paying more to producers of the everyday items that we love. But did you know that the official definition, definition is that fair trade is a trading partnership based on dialogue, transparency and respect that seeks greater equity in international trade? The fair trade movement believes the global inequality and the continual underpaying and ignoring of the rights of the people in our supply chains are a direct result of the violent histo histories of racism and colonialism the many pro products that are traded in internationally have. These products often continue to contain entrenched inequality in their production and consumption today. This is why fair trade is focused not only on fair pay, but also on partnership between producers, traders and consumers, and why we think fair trade is the gold standard when you're looking to make ethical purchasing decisions. However, this doesn't mean by any way that the fair trade movement is perfect. We can always improve the way we do things. And today we'll be hearing about the journeys that liberation foods, shared interest and transformed trade have been taking in their storytelling to become more partner-led. We will hear how these organisations gather consent use images and choose language. And as I said, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. This event has been organized by Fair Trade Wales and the Hub Cymru Af Africa Partnership as part of their Reframing the Narrative project with the Sub-Saharan Advisory Panel. The aim of the Reframing the Narrative project is to challenge harmful stereotypes of Africa and Africans in the aid and international development sector. When working in solidarity with others globally, we reflect our respect for their humanity, worth and work with dignity and justice. In its third year, this project creates opportunities for individuals, communities, groups, charities and organisations in Wales and African countries to share learning and reflect together how to respectfully tell stories and promote the sector. So, I'd like to, um, if I just introduce myself a bit further, and then I'd like to ask the speakers to tell us a bit more about themselves and the, and the organisations they represent. So as I said, I'm the chair of BAFTS, which is a growing and diverse network of independent shops and business, businesses who are fair trade at their core. As the UK's network member of the World Fair Trade Organisation, BAFTS members are committed to the 10 principles of fair trade, which include a commitment to non-discrimination. And we are working ourselves in partnership with Hub Cymru Africa to go beyond this and really look at being anti-racist in what we do and how we behave. And if I could, if I could ask the other speakers to introduce themselves, um, if you'd like to start, uh, Kate. Hello, um, don't know if you can see me, but um, my name is Kate Dixon and I work for Transform Trade. Uh, I lead on their content production. Um, so I, I do a lot of story gathering, um, I write our appeals, um, and I produce their content. Thank you, and Bernadette. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Bernadette. I am the communications manager for Liberation Foods. Um, I've been working with them for about three years, uh, doing lots of uh, content gathering, uh, managing their website, their social media, uh, any marketing materials, and um, yeah. Thank you. And Stina, please. 
Hi everyone, I'm Stina Porter, Marketing and Communications Manager at Shared Interest. Shared Interest is a social lender. Um, with the support of ethical investors in the UK, we finance businesses that follow fair trade principles. And our impact touches 45 countries across the globe. So I'm going to be talking a bit about language today because obviously um, there's a lot of different languages um, that we experience and come into contact with um, because of where all of our producers are based. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, welcome to you all. And thank you so much for coming. I'm really looking forward to what you have to say today. So if we can start with gathering the content that we use for storytelling. So Kate, can you hear your presentation? Can. Hello. Um, I'm going to talk to you mostly about consent. Um, so for those of you that don't know, Transform Trade, we used to be called Tradecraft Exchange. Um, and we were the partner charity of Tradecraft PLC. Um, but we are a totally legally uh, separate organization. We run projects, uh, we campaign for trade justice. Um, so we do very different things. We don't buy and sell fair trade goods. Um, so stories are really, really important to what we do. It's how we, we get across why what we do is important. Um, we've gone through a lot of change over the last five, six years. Um, I've been with us with Transform Trade for six years now, um, and we've been moving away from a kind of a model whereby uh, staff members would perhaps visit a project, take photographs, write down some interview quotes, and we'd come back and, and run an appeal of that. Um, we've started to look really at, at consent, and consent is not as simple um, as yes or no. So I'm going to run through how we do it at Transform Trade. It's not a one-off process. Um, consent needs to be informed. So when we're talking to people, we need to know that they understand what it is we're going to use their images and their quotes for, uh, what's going to happen to those images and quotes when they give them to us. Um, and we need to know that people can say no. And I think that's one of the most telling things about a meaningful consent process. Are the people that you're speaking to saying, no, thank you? Are they asking for caveats? Are they saying, yes, but, yes, but could you use a different name? Yes, but I don't want it used here. Um, we obviously look at slightly more complicated scenarios. Now, we as an organisation don't work with children, so we try to avoid uh, any photographs of children and we certainly don't interview children just because we don't believe that that consent process um, would work for us. For other organisations, it's, it's maybe a different story. Um, vulnerable people, we can grab language barriers. Now, we used to just have a consent form and we would talk to someone, ask them to sign the consent form. We'd have it translated by perhaps... Um, uh, partner partner project staff um, but what we've started to do is to make different consent forms for different environments um, we have them translated into the appropriate language um, they're regularly updated and also we give out a named contact so that people know that they can whatsapp a named individual um, and whatsapp tends to be the easiest way of doing this but also an email address and they can withdraw consent at any point um, we've also placed a time limit on how long we use images and quotes for. Um, so we've said five years. We've said after five years, we won't be using any of those photographs or images um, or quotes any longer um, because we don't believe that the consent can be held for that long. Can I have the next slide? Thank you. So yeah, um, the big thing is the power dynamics. Um, when we're talking about trade justice, when we're talking about fair trade, we're talking about putting people at the heart of decisions. Um, and we're talking about valuing their experiences and their take on things. Um, so the consent has to acknowledge the fact that as someone from outside a community, you may be in a position of power. So when you're asking, you have to really be, be thinking, are people agreeing because of the person who's asking or are they agreeing because they want to agree? Um, who's taking the pictures? One of the big changes we've made is we employ only photographers um, who are from the country in which we're working. Um, we always try and employ a photographer who speaks the language of the people that we are interviewing. Um, so that's something I think that makes a massive difference to the dynamics. Um, ownership of the photographs. Um, so who owns them and where are they stored? Do people know where they're going to be stored? Do people know where they're going to be used? Um, uh, and reporting back. So on the next slide. Sorry, can we have the next slide? That's the question. Um, yeah, one of the, the practical things we started to do is we report back to communities. So we try to send copies of photographs. We show people at the beginning of the consent process where their images and quotes are going to be used. Here's our website. You might show them on a phone. 
um, here's a copy of our our appeals. This is what this is what use of your image looks like. Um, basic consent forms are really key. Uh, you have to store the consent forms with the photograph so that everyone in the organisation knows how consent has been given. Safeguarding principles are universal. There is no reason that a safeguarding process in the UK should look particularly different to a safeguarding process anywhere else in the world. Um, I wouldn't go into my children's school and take photographs without permission, and that holds exactly the same anywhere else. Um, one of the things that really struck me, a photographer we worked with in Kenya, uh, she brought along a Polaroid camera, and it was a really nice gesture of kind of mutual respect, um, whereby she was taking photographs, but she was also making sure she was giving something back straight away. Um, and it was also really fun, like it, it introduced a really nice kind of mutually enjoyable dynamic of the, into the, the situation. Um, one more set of practical ideas, I think, thank you. Um, when it comes to interview, one of the things we try to do is ask really open questions so people can tell us what they want to tell us. Uh, it's very easy to come in with a script, particularly if you're from a fundraising background like myself, you want people to tell you stories of hardship uh, and, and you kind of have this idea in your head of the story you want to tell, but it's really important to let go of that, to listen to what people want to tell you. Basic politeness, bringing drinks, snacks, that kind of thing. Um, we've kind of written all of this into our processes. So a lot of th these things were happening anyway, but what we wanted to do when we were thinking about how we gathered stories was to write all this in so that we formally go, there is a budget for drinks, there is a budget for snacks, this kind of thing. Um, ensuring people know how to get hold of you. So I've talked about named contacts. Um, and obviously one of the big ones is making sure that as much as possible happens in the language of those you're talking to. Um, one of the things we're doing at the moment is a participatory photography project in India with home workers, uh, where we are working with a community um, and a photographer to, to train uh, participants in photography. So they will take their own photographs over a series of three months. So they will be in charge of what, they're, what pictures they're taking, what they're going to share, how they're going to caption them. It's obviously much more expensive and it's much more time consuming. Um, for an organisation, but we believe that if we're going to put people at the heart of trade, we need to put people at the heart of storytelling, um, and it's their story to share. So if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat, and that's my email address. Gosh, that was quite nervous. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. That, that's so interesting. Your consent is so important. And you know, just the point you make that, you know, we're told when we go to a school performance, you mustn't take pictures because you know you don't know the background of the children you know, what you might be sharing so you know we should use that wherever we are and whatever we're doing um do you if you say you have consents for someone to use their picture on a website and then you wanted to use it on a label or something different would you re go through the form the consent process we wouldn't. So the form will cover the kind of general use of, we would say, probably printed materials. We would differentiate, I think, between printed materials and appeals, because I think that can be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, but we would say online use. Um, so we wouldn't go back every time just because the logistics of it would be, the scale of it would be unfeasible. And a question to you and to the other speakers, maybe. Have you ever had people say no? We definitely have, um, and, and we do, and I'm always relieved when they do, because it means that we are actually engaged in a kind of actually consenting process, yeah. And sometimes people will make caveats, so they'll say, uh, I'd like you to only use my first name, or I'd like you to uh, use a different name. And we try where we can to give people that option. Um, yeah. We've had situations where... Um... As Kate was talking about, we, we keep images, we use images for five years and then we retire those images. And we within that five years, we'll still go back to um, the person or the cooperative in question and say, oh, we'd like to use that image. Are you OK with that? And we've had instances where they've said, well, actually, the coffee production process has moved on and it's changed. So that particular image where someone's sorting or picking coffee in a certain way isn't representative um, of how we do things now. So it's, it's like Kate said, it's so important to keep the conversation going um, because things do change um, continuously. Um, yeah, so that's, that, that's, that is really key. 
We had a really important conversation yesterday around our business and human rights campaign, um, which is changing for it's ch about changing legislation so that we can prosecute business, uh, British businesses who commit human rights abuses abroad. Um, but we had photographs taken for this uh, over five years ago, um, and we wanted to reuse these for a very specific event. And actually, it turns out there's been a secondary court case and some of the people involved may or may not have signed non-disclosure agreements. And it really kind of hammered home how important it is that consent expires, because had we used those, that could have caused, potentially caused massive problems for the people who were involved in the first place. Did, did you have anything you wanted to add, Bernadette? Do you use a similar? Um, well, we've always had... Um depending on the situation people saying no and I think that's brilliant as Kate said I think you know it's, it makes things very clear and very easy um, and sometimes there's it is it is complex when you're asking people particularly when it's in another language particularly when your context the context of your business is very alien to the people that you are taking the photos of um, when people just say no it means like okay fine we, there's absolutely no um, kind of it's it's completely clear what they want and that's absolutely fine it's I think for us it's harder when people say yes and you're still not sure if they fully understand the context in which it'll be used obviously there's never any kind of malintent behind it but you are sometimes like do they know that this will be going out to, to much wider audiences and I think that's the thing that needs to be um, made clear great so that that leads nicely then into Bernadette's <laughs> about images. <laughs> so um, I will just explain a little bit about Liberation Foods first, because I realised I didn't do a very good job about that at, at the beginning. So Liberation Foods, we are an organisation that sells um, fair trade uh, nut products mainly, although we're looking at expanding it into other, uh, other pro uh, produce. Um, we are a community interest company and um, work with fair trade farmers around the world, um, mainly in uh, India, um, Africa and Latin America. Um, we are um, in fact majority owned by uh, the International Nut Cooperative that is a umbrella uh, cooperative with a membership, uh, an international membership. So, um, Aside from all else, the smallholder farmers are um, the majority owners of the business. So they, they are really at the core of everything that we do. Um, putting that across is often um, <laughs> quite difficult. Um, I wanted to start thinking about imagery. I wanted to start with this idea of, as, as Kate actually touched on, um, what we want an image to say versus the reality. Um, and this can transfer, I think this can transfer into personal life as well. And there's this whole idea around Instagram versus reality, where you, you know, you want to cut out all the, the rubbish on the beach so that you're on a pristine beach on holiday, or you want to uh, tweak the, the lighting so that you just don't look that tired. Um, and this, again, can transfer into, um, into your professional world and what you are going when you go and you want to take photographs of something what you want to put across. And as Kate also said, you need to um, let that go and that you need to go and do what you want to be doing that's representing as much of the truth and reality as possible. Um, and uh, that can sometimes be difficult. Um, oh, sorry, go back. <laughs> um, because sometimes it might feel like it's not that, not that interesting. Um, but actually this image is an example of that because what, what does make an image interesting more than anything is putting context to it and putting a story behind it. Um, so this here is, um, I went to Nicaragua with a filmmaker and we, uh, this is Ignacio, who is stirring his um, homemade pesticides. Potentially not the most interesting or thrilling uh, moment in the day. However, when you put it into context, and um, it can create a very, very interesting story, and it is very interesting. So in this situation, um, a few years before, the cooperative brought over a Cuban um, scientist who trained some of the farmers how to make their own homemade pesticides and fertilizers out of um, kitchen store ingredients. Um, not only that, but it was so specific that it was which insect that liked which plant, 
uh, to stop them from, from eating all the crops and which crops particularly like certain types of fertilizer. Um, and Ignacio explained to me that he said, I have a quote here, if a product that is agroecological kills anything, it isn't eco. What we are looking for is to make a product that gives a bad taste to the leaf. It's the same as when somebody puts something bitter on a tortilla. You're just not going to eat it. Well, it's the same for the bug. It will just go elsewhere. It's an agreement with nature. It's not breaking the equilibrium. We all have the right to live and we all have a function. And I thought that was beautiful and very, very well explained, much better <laughs> explained than I would be able to do. Um, not only that, but obviously they are now going out and they are offering free training to the rest of the farmers within the cooperative and those that aren't connected to the cooperative on how they can also make their own homemade organic fertilizers and pesticides. And um, that means that they can avoid having to buy imported agrochemicals that they have no um, power over the fluctuating prices of these chemicals and also they don't know very little about what goes into them. So my, as an example, that is giving context to images brings them to life. It doesn't necessarily need to be what, uh, that the image is the most perfect, interesting, exciting uh, content. So the next slide um, kind of moves on from that. And there's two, uh, two parts that I want to make in this. One is that, Unlike the previous slide where you, I had context to be able to bring it to life, sometimes that's very hard to get. Um, and I had recently just come back from a trip to India um, and uh, I was going to the seed festival, which was absolutely amazing with thousands of farmers coming through to show their, their produce. And there was um, exchanges of uh, years, generations old, uh, knowledge on farming and regenerative agricultural techniques, um, talks, presentations, events, loads of stuff. And I couldn't understand any of it because it was in um, Malayalam. And I spoke to my partner that night and I was like, oh, it's so frustrating because there's so much I would love to be able to say about it. And I know that I'm missing so much. And he was just like, why don't you just, you know, add a little bit of detail in just to make it a bit more interesting. I was like, oh. I cannot do that, not only because I'm about to do this, <laughs> this event, but also because in general, as much as you would like to, and it's probably with all good intent, you cannot retell a story, even if it, you think it will do good in terms of getting across the, the incredible work that is going on. On the other side is making sure that you are rigorous with your note taking when you are taking, uh, when you are collecting images um, and I have made and this has come up back to bite me a few times um, one is with these two images so Tommy actually runs the um, the cooperative in in Kerala and um, I was writing an article about the farmers protests that were taking place across India last year and I interviewed him um, by phone and I've spoken to him many times um, but I um, hadn't um, ever seen him. And I went through our um, image bank and found the photo on the right. And I was like, this is perfect. Um, put it together, sent it off. And Tommy replied saying, well, the article is fine, but this image is about 15 years old. And I am um, older, grayer, slightly bolder, and with a slightly bigger belly. So can you please change it? And that is, just one small example of how um, you need to keep on top of these things, dating things, putting names, to, not just names, but giving wider context as to where these images are. Um, there was a more uh, serious issue that I had before when I um, was, it was International Women's Day and I wanted to put some, um, some images up of women in Del Campo Cooperative in Nicaragua that we were, that we were, um, talking about a project that they were involved in. And I found this really beautiful image portrait of a woman um, linked to the cooperative and I uploaded it. And very soon after I had a, um, I had a, a, the old comms manager from Liberation got in touch and said, hi Bernadette, just to let you know that that woman actually passed away a few years ago. 
um and I only found and she, and she said to me I only found that out because I did the same thing and obviously that's a much more serious issue you do not want to be posting something like that um and that could have easily been avoided if that had been noted <laughs> um so my point here is for many reasons, when you are collecting content, not only write in the titles, but also maybe have a document that lists all the additional information that you could gather so that people can refer to it. And that will help in terms of building storytelling and being able to give realistic information. But also when you hear updated information, take note of it so that that sort of um, issue doesn't happen again. Um, finally, um, give credit where it's due. Again, Kate touched, touched upon this slightly in terms of um, ideas of collaboration and the project that they are doing in India, which sounds fantastic. Um, I This photo here, I love, this is of um, a woman called Candida. It's taken by Edwin, who is in fact the logistics coordinator for Del Campo Cooperative. And when we went out there with the filmmaker, he came with us and was an avid photographer, really loved it. And I started to think, why aren't we working with him um, to bring us some of this photography and this content? And this started um, me up with an idea of a comms, uh, with a com cross-continent collaboration for comms. And I am now working on developing links with people within the cooperatives that have an interest potentially in photography, in content gathering, in filmmaking, where we can work with those um, uh, to be able to gather content rather than relying on trips, annual, biannual trips from Liberation to visit those cooperatives. Um, and it seems like for me, thinking about it, there's a huge amount of benefit within it. Um, we would be getting more regular, up-to-date information. We would be working with somebody that would know far better than we do what is important at the time, what are the key issues, what is the wider social and political context, um, and we would be working in collaboration. And fair trade should be um, about trade and not aid, and this should be kept in mind all the time, which also means that if you are doing something like that, you should be paying people. This shouldn't be a favour. It should be a, um, an exchange. And lastly, sorry, I've been talking a long time. Um, uh, be generous with the images. If you have some, if you've collected something and you think it's, um, you've worked in collaboration, you've taken, as Kate said, with the Polaroids, share what you have with them. Share them to be able to use them potentially on their own uh, social media or within their own marketing or person, for personal use. Um, I think being generous and also always giving credit to photographers, never forget to do that. So in summary, very, very quickly, um, the next slide just summarizes what, can we move to the next slide? Yeah. So very quickly, um, don't alter other people's realities. Instead, give context to the photos and that will bring them to life. Be very vigilant with your image bank, take notes, um, update the information and uh, also obviously take on board everything that Kate has said in terms of consent. Um, authenticity comes with collaboration and working with people that are within those areas. Uh, be generous and share what you have with those people and don't forget to credit. Well, thanks Bernadette, that's, that's really great, really interesting and thank you for being, you know, <laughs> to say when things go wrong because <laughs> how it how it can happen and yeah how awful you feel yeah That's and it and, and it does happen we're you know like this is a process and I think all of this is not um none of us are perfect at it and actually just before I went I had a, a meeting with Stina because we don't have ready-made consent forms and I was like oh god you know what we can but I think you know the fact is as long as you are working on it and you know keep trying to improve and keep looking and reviewing um you're going to make mistakes because we're human and we're not, none of these things are perfect and especially as small businesses you know you have little limited resource um so just keeping that in mind but 
making note of those mistakes and working on them so they don't happen again. Yeah, and that happens with, you know, all sorts of things that we're trying to get better. It's language and all sorts of things. It's very easy. Yeah. It's wrong, but the point is to learn from... Exactly. And, and also think about, you know, when you're not there, maybe you might feel like you have a full understanding of how your organisation works and how the systems work. But think about colleagues. And if you leave, you don't want to leave and take away all of that knowledge. So keeping note of all of that is extremely important for, for future um, activity, whether you're there or not. Uh, is there anything the other speakers would like to add on that subject? Uh, Kate or Stina? I think I would um, second the fact that it's an ongoing journey um, and an ongoing conversation. And I think the key is the conversation, you know, to, to as we said before, I think as we keep um, communication, lines of communication open with people who are sharing their stories, that's, that's the key point. And, um, you know, when, when I did have the chat with Bernadette the other day, I was explaining that, yes, consent forms are, are important and can be important. And, and so is obviously, you know, getting consent on video. Um, there's all, lots of different ways because obviously people have different levels of accessibility. But the, the main thing is to keep talking and to, to um, keep that conversation going because things can evolve all the over time, as we discussed earlier. So, yeah. And I guess there's also the issue sometimes of the words you put with an image can change its context as well. So you can, yes, it can very much change what it was meant to be saying to something quite different with the wrong wording. And I think you um, can have, sorry, um, we've had a, a an awkward one recently where um, the intentions are really there. And one of the things we struggle with as a charity, especially, is that and particularly with the campaigns work, is sometimes we need to show need. Uh, we need to show that there is a need for funding or we need to show that there is a need for justice or that something is, is happening that's not right. And of course, in terms of photographs, that can be really complicated. And um, so we try to avoid using photographs for that. And we're, we're hoping to kind of look at some illustration as an alternative um, because we're not comfortable with the idea of photographing people in, in distress or, or kind of, that's a whole kind of, very unpleasant aspect to that um but one of the things we did was we we used a, a photograph in a report uh, about fast fashion um that was a, a photograph of a, of a sewing machine and it was a report um that was going out to some quite big brands um calling out abuses in, in fashion supply chains but the they came back to us and said well that's not us that's not our sewing machine um, and they're right because we haven't we didn't have the photographs because we hadn't been able to go in and take photographs in that particular we knew they existed but for reasons of confidentiality we couldn't use those photos so we tried to replace it with this kind of generic sewing machine image and were caught out caught out isn't the right word that our intentions were right but obviously the problem was that they went that's not us um, so one of the things we're looking at is is sometimes there are alternatives to photographs as well and and how can we make use of those um, yeah. Okay, brilliant. So uh, there's a good time to move on then to language. And uh, Stina, would you like to hear your presentation? Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many people joining us here today for this behind the scenes glimpse into fair trade storytelling. Um, as I mentioned earlier, shared interest is a social lender. And I'll explain a little more about our work in a moment. Um, but in terms of our storytelling, to come back to our impact, which touches 45 countries across the globe. So to truly understand that impact, we listen and learn from the lived experiences of people living and working in the communities involved. People tell their stories in their chosen language. And I say chosen because people may speak two, three or more languages, but may prefer to tell their story in their first language for a variety of reasons. So why the power of language? I read a book last year that I keep on my desk beside me as a reference, and it's called Speaking and Sharing by Kubra Gumase. Kubra talks about how she speaks, writes, and thinks in three languages and feels in four. How quickly she speaks, her tone of voice, and her state of mind change from language to language. 
I think that that's a fascinating topic and we don't have time to fully explore it today, but I think it gives insight into the considerations involved in how people are expelling their stories. So today I'm going to talk you through some examples of how we as an organisation take responsibility for sharing these stories as authentically as possible and how we navigate the challenges involved. Next slide, please. For those who haven't heard of Shared Interest, we are an international organisation with a team in the UK, Ghana, Costa Rica, Kenya and Peru. We bring together a community of over 12,000 people in the UK of investing in a fairer world. We act cooperatively, pooling the investment of our members to make loans to agricultural and handcraft businesses in often remote or rural communities where there may be limited income opportunities and people are facing increased challenges such as the effects of climate change. Next slide, please. People are therefore at the center of our communications. These contributors generously share their time as well as their images, experiences and perspectives with us. And they make our communications powerful and effective by showing the impact and importance of our work. So we feel that we have a responsibility to tell their stories accurately and ethically, and this process takes time and consideration. This is why our impact studies form the backbone of our storytelling and overall communications. They are a key part of our social accounting process, and the content is externally audited by the Social Audit Network. This detailed process gives us the opportunity to explore the stories behind a business we have financed for five years or more. We are really grateful to the businesses involved for supporting us. We carry out detailed research before we begin to gather content. This involves interviewing people throughout the supply chain, from farmers to founders of the organisations. As we mentioned earlier, we only commission in-country photographers and filmmakers to spend time capturing their daily routine. These stories help us explain the impact of our work to external audiences. But how do we do this in a way that maintains the integrity of the story when there are different languages involved? Let's start by using the example of our Fair Trade Fortnite campaign. This week, we have been preparing our cover wrap for the Big Issue magazine. This involves us taking over the cover of the magazine itself, and we do this every year. If you buy a copy of the Big Issue magazine the week commencing the 27th of February, you'll see Fiorella pictured here on the cover. Fiorella lives in the Tambillo region of Peru. She began collecting moss eight years ago to earn an income to support her family. We asked her if there had been any changes since she started working with a social enterprise called Inca Moss who we provide finance to. And she said, the main change I have seen in the community is that children can now get the proper food they need to be healthy. And the community as a whole has an additional source of income to cover the needs we have. Next slide, please. Inca Moss is a social enterprise and a certified B Corp dedicated to the production and export of sphagnum moss. It was formed in 2010 by founder Marco Pinatelli and currently works with 562 harvesters in 38 communities, offering training to rural potato farmers. Fiorella and Denicio generously offered their time so we could hear more about their experience of gathering the moss and how this work has impacted the people and communities around them so that we can understand the impact of shared interest finance on communities and the people who live there. Fiorella and Denicio both spoke Spanish throughout our contact with them. So how did they manage this content gathering process? Next slide, please. Well, as an international organisation, we are extremely fortunate to have a team of people who between us speak 18 languages. This means that sometimes we are able to ask colleagues to support us in a translation or interpretation task. We also have a network of translator volunteers who assist us or people working within the sector sometimes offer their time on a pro bono basis. There are occasions when we engage language service providers. 
This was the case recently when we needed translation and interpreting services, services in Kenya, Rwanda, the national language of Rwanda. In terms of the Inca Moss interviews with Fiorella and Denicio, Inca Moss impact manager Juan Holadines acted as interpreter and translator throughout this process. We held the interviews by conference call and recorded them so we could refer back to them for accuracy purposes. Once interpreted and translated into English, Fiorella's and Denicio's stories were prepared for publication. They were then translated back into Spanish so that we could share the end result with Fiorella and Denicio. This is where the process becomes really interesting and creates a space for feedback, as we were talking about earlier, for that conversation so that we can look for any instances where something may have been lost in translation. To refer back to Kubra in her book, Speaking and Being, she says, if you speak a second language, you can doubtless think of numerous terms that describe phenomena, situations or emotions for which there is no direct English counterpart. Just as there are some ideas I can articulate in English that get lost in another language, like serendipity or no brainer. I was thinking of terms like this that I use, and words like eager or deja vu spring to mind. And um, the latter I used just this morning on the school run. And these words have been adopted from Danish and French, respectively, into the English language. And for me, this illustrates Kubra's theory perfectly. I've also experienced instances of this within our storytelling at Shared Interest. For example, when we received captioned images that showed Brazil nut gatherers at their concession. We couldn't find any direct translation for this online, so went to our colleagues in South America for help. They told us, in the case of the Amazon jungle, the Ministry of Agriculture grants farmers the possibility of managing an area of the jungle with the purpose that they live there and take care of the forest. This made sense, but there was no direct translation available. So in the case of an impact study, we would use the word concession and then add it to our growing glossary of terminology. In the case of image captioning, this can be tricky as there's limited space available to describe what's happening in the image. However, we do aim to include some of the story in a quote where possible every time we feature an image, just as you see in this presentation in order to include the producer voice wherever possible or relevant. We have also had instances where people who told their story previously have given us more information or a new perspective on what's been said. And I know Kate and Bernadette have both touched upon this earlier. This is because stories evolve, because life and indeed in, in language evolves. That's why throughout all of this, as we said earlier, continued conversation is key. Next slide, please. At the core of our storytelling and content gathering is our ongoing contact with the people who share their stories. This is the true essence of informed consent, which Kate touched on earlier. By keeping lines of communication open, we can share the results of contributors' stories with them, ask them for their thoughts on how we represented their story, and give people the option of withdrawing their story at any time. We will be sharing the big issue cover app with Fiorella and Denicio and look forward to hearing their thoughts on the content they so generously support us in creating. Next slide. And that brings me to the end of my presentation today. Thank you for listening. And if you have anything you'd like to discuss, please do get in touch. The contact details are on the screen. And I'll now hand back over to Len Shima. Thank you, Stina. Again, really, really interesting points. And you know, touching on some very the same things coming up of keeping open lines, communication, being ready to evolve. And yes, I hadn't really thought of that part of language, the, the translating and the retranslating and how things can be lost. I think, you know, in Wales as well, I guess for Fair Trade Wales, you could then have a story that then is translated again into Welsh. And each time it's possible for the meaning to be lost or diluted or changed yeah and language generally have we all can we all think of examples where perhaps we terms we would have used that we think differently about in what we say how we we're changing our language generally as a movement 
Yes, I think um, with terminology um, such as developing countries or developing world, um, that is something that we've moved away from and looking for alternative language. Um, there's many different um, examples, really. Um, beneficiaries, for instance, um, saying participants. Um, it's all really relates back to, well, you know, when I, when I call the, the presentation the power of language, it's got so many meanings and language can be powerful. But as Kate um, said earlier, and I think Bernadette as well, um, it's about sort of thinking about the power that's involved when we are um, listening to people's stories and sharing those stories and, and really thinking about how we can do that um, on an equal playing field. Um, and so by using words like participants instead of beneficiaries, that removes the power from that situation. So I think that's really the crux that lies behind a lot of the work that we do in looking at our language. It's really thinking about the power and how to remove that. It's a massive one for us. I think across the whole NGO sector, it's been a big, a big thing to think about. Um, for us in Transform Trade, we've been looking at, at poverty and and how we're using poverty. And, and I would say back maybe 10 years ago, we talked a lot about poor people and we wouldn't want to say that anymore because it, it's a value judgment on an individual. And what we want to talk about is the context um, that that person's living in. Um, and for us, our kind of our our mission is about people-centered trade. And when we're using language, what we want to do is people-centered language. So what are we saying about that person when we're talking about them? Um, what are the value judgments we're putting on that? Um, poverty in the field was one of my favorites that I, I particularly struggle with, this idea that you would you would go on a visit to the field. It's not a field, it's a specific place. It's a specific country to specific people. Um, so let's let's use people's names. Let's, let's name the places we're talking about. Um, yeah. I think also that can be the, the, not only talking about people and and um, communities, but it, the example of language in relation to the environment as well is evolving very quickly with climate, the climate crisis, and how um, that is now looked upon differently, and also how that affects different communities. Um, and I think you can really track the change in a very short period of time as to how it's being talked about and how it will continue to evolve as the situation evolves. And um, I think, yeah, language is fascinating because it, it, it puts things in a different context and it really reflects the time. And luckily, it, well, hopefully, we are becoming more and more um, aware of that as we, as we move forward. Yeah, it's it. Constantly moving and yes, can't stay still. <laughs> so um, before I sort of throw open to the audience, I'd like to ask a sort of devil's advocate sort of question. So given all the potential problems in storytelling, do we in the fair trade sector use it too much? Should we be at the forefront talking about the quality, the design, the uniqueness? of the products and let them sell themselves? Or is there always gonna be in a value of telling the stories behind them? But uh, if I just speak from a product perspective, as we obviously, we sell the products that these farmers um, produce. Um, I think there's definitely value in the quality. I think one of the things that it, for, for me, um, looking at these products is very inspirational and actually I think could be very, very beneficial for every member of society everywhere, is understanding the work that goes into producing something, um, growing something, uh, caring for it, especially doing it in a sustainable, regenerative form. It's a huge skill. It's very hard work. It takes a lot of knowledge and wisdom. Um, and it's the best way for us to be producing our food. So I think within that, that that is there is story there and it should and it should go into that that is what makes up um uh many of the commodities that we consume here without really thinking about it and that can be applied and that is you know fair trade because there is so much work that goes into it and people still there is a disconnect between the food that we eat um and how it is grown, how it is produced, everything, you know, the huge amount of work that goes into it. I'm sure people that garden here have their own vegetable patch. They will understand 
to what to some extent what <laughs> what is involved in that but you know this is what these farms are doing and it is hard and this is very very skilled and they know far more than we do and I think that is a very important story to tell. I think I'd like to see more storytelling not less and I'd, I'd like to see storytelling from non-fair trade products because I think that's where we would really see the contrast. Um, I think the reason in the trade justice world that we're able to tell stories is because we are open and transparent um, so from a kind of switching that round perspective I'd like to see the story of Primark's clothing production. I'd like to see the story of Tate and Lyle's sugar production. And I think, yeah, more stories is better for transparency and for openness. Um, yeah. I, I agree with that. I think um, the more stories we can tell, the more we can understand and people's lived experiences are really the way to do that. Um, a shared interest, we, we finance businesses, but we really want to understand how people um, how, how, how this, you know, how those businesses, what the, the effect they have on people and communities and, and for our investors. So we are able to finance um, fair trade businesses because our investors in the UK invest their money. Um, so we they want to know, um, you know, how how is that money helping? Um, so by telling the stories, we can really connect those social investors in the UK with farmers and artisans across the globe and um People really do want to hear from them, um, you know, how it is making a difference. Um, so we think it's really important. And I think what I love is when people are telling their stories and it, it sort of moves away from even with them talking about their work and then they start and talk about their hopes and dreams and, and you know, makes it into like a three-dimensional story, which avoid, avoids the single narrative. Um, we were speaking to a coffee farmer in Rwanda and he was talking about, you know, how one day he wants to open his own pub. And I just love that element <laughs> of the story because it just really brings things to life and you can really understand that person as a whole person and not just, you know, for their job or their role or a section of their lives, which I think is really, really important. Yeah, brilliant. I think, you know, we all see the value in it and it's, it's good to affirm it. <laughs> Aileen, are there some questions from the chat? Hello, there are lots of questions in the chat and more coming. So, um, yeah, the first question was about sort of copyright issues and whether you have issues with people reusing photos without permission and that sort of thing. Um, and tied into that really is the issue. Another question that's come up, which is the case for a lot of our groups, is that a lot of fair trade groups, they don't go and gather photos. They don't have these issues, but they still want to use images and use uh, and fair trade whales. We're the same. We don't we don't go and gather all of our images. We often use other people's. So how do we do that? Um, and is there anywhere where we can have access to sort of copyright cleared photos and, and how and how we can access them? So there's kind of two sides of something, really. Guess as a sort of database keeper of transform trade for photos, I wouldn't necessarily be keen to share photographs unless they were credited. So I would happily share images as long as the person uh, using them agreed to kind of credit transform trade and the photographer in question. Um, and we would obviously always provide kind of the name of the person and, and all of that. And we would expect when that image was used, we would expect the person to provide all of that information. We obviously try and produce a lot of our own in-house kind of marketing materials as well so our magazines appeals and that kind of thing so they would all be readily available and we would send this out to anyone who wanted to share them um, for us it would be about trying to keep those pictures in context and captioned um, so we wouldn't want to just share photographs of someone um, without that information accompanying it if that makes sense yeah, I would echo what everything that Kate's just said. Um, and um, basically with the copyright. So um, we when we work with in-country photographers, um, we will only work with um, photographers where obviously they agree to us owning the copyright. So we're not saying that the photographer couldn't use those photographs, but they would have to consult with us first because as, as Kate was saying, we have the contact with the producers. So we would need to then you know, need to be sure that that image might be used in the right way. Um, so, yeah, it's really, really important that we do own the copyright on the images because 
we we don't want them to be um, used for for you know any other purpose and where the person in the image then we lose control over it basically so as we said before we like to retire images after five years and if somebody else has then gone on to use that image that might not be the case so it's about protecting really the person who's agreed to share their story and share their image. Yeah, I think once, once it's out, then you, you don't have that way of just checking that everything that you've tried to put in place is still being, being adhered to. Yeah. Uh, any more, Aileen? Yeah, we have a question asking about how we measure the impact of storytelling. And how do we tell if stories have achieved their purpose? Hmm. How do we sort of, yeah, measure that? How do you justify that to funders or your line manager for the budget you need or whatever? <laughs> so I think we at Transform Trade would have a slightly different answer to that because obviously we don't, we're not selling anything. Um, so for us, we would be looking at things like appeal income. Um, if we'd kind of used a story for a particular fundraising appeal, that's a really, a really obvious one. Um, but it's never that simple, is it? Because it's not just the story people are giving to you, they're giving to you the work, they're giving to your organisation's kind of ethos. Um, so it's always a little bit more complicated. We justify some of the expenditure, things like the participatory photography project um, that we're about to start. It's a lot more expensive than our standard content gathering, and we have had to kind of make some special allowances for that. But we basically say that it's it's part of our values and therefore we justify the cost on that those means it's also a means of um measuring impact on not external audiences but on the participants themselves so they're telling their story and they're telling us what difference our work has made to their lives um through photography so that's kind of another way of looking at it is it, it's a form of monitoring and evaluation um i don't know how you would measure financially or even if you would you i don't know how do you guys do it I feel like you, it sort of makes you feel slightly uncomfortable thinking, how do you measure the sort of, you know, but, but I, I understand what the person's asking. And and I guess it, it's similar in that, you know, we tell stories um, for a variety of reasons. And part of that is, as I said earlier, um, we carry out impact studies. So every year, um, this year we're carrying out two, last year we carried out three. So this is, these are huge um, pieces of work for us. Um, and uh, continuously happening over the course of the year. So basically, um, as part of our impact studies, we need to listen to people's stories because, as Kate said, that is how we do measure our impact um, alongside a lot of other variables. But we really need to know at the end of the day, you know, how our work is impacting people's lives. Um, but in terms of um, sort of engaging and recruiting new investors, I think people's stories are really important. And, um, you know, we send out a member magazine four times a year called Quarterly Return. And we do know that from our members that, you know, they will invest further based on the stories they are hearing, because obviously that gives them, you know, the, the assurance that their investment is, you know, doing what they wanted to do to have a social impact. Um, so we survey our members members every year and we do ask them, um, you know, and we do have a really good um, read rate of QR. Um, so it is really important in engagement, I think, and retention, as well as um, as well as bringing new investors on board. But most crucially, um, I think it is about understanding how our work does, you know, hopefully make a difference to people's lives. Uh basically echoing what both the Kate and Christina have just said but obviously as products as well it's kind of um it's slightly easier to measure in a way although it couldn't necessarily put be put down to a specific story um but uh I think the storytelling that goes on behind when they're ethical sustainable products that do cost a bit more the reason why they cost a bit more has to be explained you know so for example we sell a bag of cashews for one price and there's one that is a pound less why well this is why and, and what goes into that is you know the storytelling behind it because um people need to feel like justified in spending their hard-earned money especially these days when we're in a 
bad uh, economic situation, there needs to be a, a very solid reason for why they should spend more. And, and storytelling is one of those way, the ways to um, put that forward. We certainly see a spike for, if we know a story is done really well for emails, for example, over like a Christmas appeal or an Easter appeal, there might be one particular story which has a much higher open rate or results in, in far more donations. Um, but often it's quite hard to pull that apart. So some of it might be to do with the fact that it's a Christmas appeal rather than Easter in appeal. So it's quite hard to judge the, the story on an individual case by case basis. Um, we know that stories do really well, that people are interested in stories, but it's very difficult to work out exactly what kind of stories. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think we, we definitely see um, running a shop, you know, face to face with the customer, you'll get someone drawn to something because they like it. But often being able to then tell them the story of where it was made, how it was made, what it was made from, is what clinches the sale for them. You know, sometimes they're not bothered, they just like something and want it. <laughs> but yes, being able to tell that story and knowing it can make a difference. Okay, we got another question. Yes, a um, uh, couple of questions which were quite quick. So somebody asked for the details of the book you were reading, Stina, which Sally has put in the chat. So if people want to know what that book was, but if you could tell us again anyway. And there's also a question which was about the consent forms, really. And would any of you be, have you any of you got templates that we could maybe share with participants afterwards of what, what the consent forms are? Consent you ask. With the book, with the book, I've actually got it here, <laughs> but I don't know if it reverses it out when I put it up to my camera because it does when I look at my own camera. But it's called Speaking and Being um, by Kubra Gumase. Um, Yeah, it was actually um, it was Sally who um, brought this author to my attention, which is why she's um, put that in the chat because we both um, went along to a seminar um, where Kubra was um, speaking online. And I was so inspired by it. And I think now it's just my most kind of read and referred to book that I have. And I, yeah, so um, I don't know if you can see that, but that's it there. But I think Sally has put the details in the chat as well. Yeah, we can see that fine, the right way round. <laughs> in terms of our forms, we don't have a template um, because it's not, it's never a one size fits all approach. So for us, in every single scenario, it will change the way we do that. So we can't share a, a template as such, but I'm really, really happy to have conversation with anybody who wants to talk about their situation and what they might be able to do. So my contact details, I'm happy for you to share those and, and I'll have that, that sort of one-on-one -on -one conversation because, yeah, it's, we don't have a template because it changes every time. So we adapt and it's got to be very fluid. So we have a generic form, but as Tina says, it would be, we would change it for every context, but I'm happy if anybody wants that as a kind of starting point, um, just drop me an email and I'm, I'm happy to, to share that. Um, so. <laughs> Fab, um, we have another question. So how can we all contribute to the encouragement of safe storytelling? in a broader context. Um, and we've had a question from Matthew about languages and translators, but Matthew, could you explain a bit more in the chat whilst they're answering this question? Because I don't fully understand what you were asking, thanks. So can you repeat the question? <laughs> yes, of course. How can we all contribute to the encouragement of safe storytelling in a broader context? I guess it, it depends which, what kind of role that you're playing within that storytelling. Um, but I think um, it, I think really it's about enabling or providing a space for somebody to tell their story sort of honestly and authentically. I think that's that's the key, really. Um, and I know we touched upon that earlier by, you know, the way that you if you if you're interviewing somebody by the way you ask the questions um not to like have guide like sort of leading questions and um really it's about um like I say providing a space for someone to tell the story that's 
not just within the narrative that then you want to shape it into. I think that's that's the most important thing. And I think that's how anybody can contribute. I guess it's about having good listening skills. Um, so I guess when any when anybody's telling you their story or having a conversation, I guess it's it's really listening and not just hearing what you want to hear, but but listening to what they have to say. I also think just in terms of, as Dina mentioned, the role that you play within it, um, perhaps it's not doing the interview or um, gathering it yourself, but sharing it and, and being aware of where this content has come from um, before you reshare it or before you make a comment on it. You know, being a bit more analytic, because obviously with in this day and age, you can get information from anywhere and anyone could have written it. And, you know, there's very little um the culpability to be held to many of the stories so just thinking a little bit and being a little bit careful about um what you decide to do with as a third party with that with that content um i think is important as well i think there's probably also something um about what you choose to consume so looking at what the stories you're reading and i think particularly in the kind of fair trade or um, international development context, um, look at whose stories you're reading. Do you think that the, the way they're being told is, is respectful? Do you think it reflects shared values? And, and have a think about that and feedback to organisations. You know, if, if you see, if you get into the charity appeal or a, a piece of content through the door from an organisation and you feel that story sits uncomfortably with you, people are always willing to learn and to listen. I think, I think we all kind of have a role in that too. Um, yeah, I think all of our organisations yeah, would be glad to hear that, to be able to reflect on it and maybe learn something that make our own work better. Okay. Have you got another question, Aileen? Yes, there are lots. Um, <laughs> Keep them coming. <laughs> people, people are generally just saying how wonderful it is and how, uh, yes, people are having a good time and I uh, <laughs> think it's a really good conversation. So I'll just do this last question we've had. So um, it's because it's in relation to what we've just been talking about, which is should we call out companies who tell stories and make claims? Um, it's quite common in certain industries. Um, and is that something that we should be calling out? And how how maybe should we do that if it is the right thing to do? Well, yeah, I think as Kate said earlier, I think it is important to to you know to to inform people or organisations if something does sit uncomfortably. Um, and I think it is really important to um, you know when you are stating a piece of research, something we feel you know we're really really sort of um, focused on is providing the source of that information. But sometimes it's not even just enough to provide the source. Sometimes you've got to go back to the source and find out exactly where they found the information. Um, we, I have found that in the past when I've included a piece of research and then um, you drill down a bit further and actually the source where they, they might have got the information from somewhere else and then it sort of gets adjusted over time. So I think it's really important with research and um, when that comes externally, um, just really making sure um, doing that little bit more research behind the source, just to find out exactly um, where that comes from and originates from too. I think you can ask as well. I think I think it's perfectly reasonable. Any company, you know, anyone selling anything, you it's perfectly reasonable to email and go, look, tell me a little bit more about this, you know you're telling me that you're I'm guessing from the sort of product sales perspective if someone's selling you a product with this really happy story ask for details ask how much that is being paid ask what the supply chain looks like you know and, and any organization that that has those values will be able to answer those questions or try their best to um so I think yeah I think stories I guess there is that power that the narrative and a really good story could maybe be used to obscure something um, so asking questions is, is always a good thing. Um, okay. You're on mute, Lenshina. Sorry. I knew I'd have to do it once wrong. <laughs> but can I ask you all then to close? 
what are your hopes for storytelling and the future of it? And your hopes and fears, maybe, for the future. Um, we we'll start with uh, Stina. I think I just hope that, you know, people will continue to, to share their stories and, and to have that safe space um, where they can do that. Um, I think I think as things move on, it will never come to the end of the journey, as we said earlier, where we're doing everything perfectly. But I think what we can do is try and create a space and an environment so people can tell their stories honestly and that we can tell them as accurately as possible because we'll continue to learn and learn from our mistakes as you know as we, we, we chatted about earlier um and by having conversations and events like these i think the more we can keep that conversation going then, then better really so so i think the future's you know really bright in terms of storytelling What, Kate? Yeah, um, for me, I hope it's something that um, organisations in the trade justice movement continue to invest in. Um, I'd like to see uh, a little bit more direct storytelling. So I, I don't, I think the the storytelling world is, is getting better and the kind of the way in which we um, we use the internet, we use WhatsApp and this kind of thing means that we can share stories much more quickly and much more frequently. Um, and we can kind of almost sometimes remove that, that middle that middleman um and i'd like to see some more of that um, i think it's quite exciting and technology technology changes how we tell stories and how quickly we can we can share information and i think that's that's quite an exciting thing um bernadette and you um yeah i mean to echo the others i think um you know hopefully storytelling will continue uh, i mean storytelling has been the form of passing on knowledge and information for generations and generations um and hopefully it will continue um and i hope that um it uh continues in a way that is more and more um authentic and linked to um the communities that are telling the stories like the project that um kate was talking about at transform trade like that it comes directly from the people and less through a middleman or less through us and that we are just in the position to be able to share it to a wider audience. Fantastic. So, um, so wrapping up, I think key points that have come out is to do with not imposing the story you want to tell, but listening to the authentic actual story, keeping clear and detailed records, and making sure you have informed consent and feeding back what you're sharing with the people whose stories you're sharing and listening to how they feel about that and realizing it's an ongoing process, being prepared to change as, as and when we learn more. So I'd like to thank all of you for your really interesting and honest contribution to this discussion. I've learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else here as as well. So thank you to Stina and Kate and Bernadette.